Craig Hoffman. We did rectify the situation on the air. So Anthony has now consumed a dumpling. Actually, two. Well, you guys are problem solvers, which is why I agree to come on your show. I like <laughs> that. You guys look for solutions. And so what was the outcome? What's Anthony say? The Hoffman Show. Hey, DA, I'm not going to lie. I love dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. On the T980 and the Odyssey app. All right, final hour of the show from Radio Row in Indianapolis. The Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. This has been one of the most fun shows that I've done, maybe since we started this thing uh, back in June. Because it's just like all my friends come sit down at the table, I hand them a microphone, and it's like, hey, let's let's talk. That ter- certainly continues right now. My guy Trevor Sekuma from Pro Football Focus who uh i've no so we were just reminiscing in the break and i was like mm-hmm. we're gonna we're gonna go through a little bit of this on the air so the, so the audience understands this is the beauty of having your own radio show where like you're a personality on top of just a guy who gives takes uh well like i've known you since 2019 2018 gotta be 2019 yeah, yeah. 2019 2018 something like that uh because i know or i met your soon-to-be wife Indeed. At, at one of these nfl events i think in owners meetings yes. and so uh, I've been friends with Alyssa Lang, who many people have seen on uh, SEC Network and on ESPN uh, since probably 2017. Mm-hmm. And then at some point in that 2017 to 2019 range, a date you surely know, uh, you guys you guys got together. Uh, and then February 18, 2018. There you go. There you go. Very good. Alyssa, he passed when you inevitably listen to this later. Uh, and then... I was oh, saying it was 2019, so I didn't pass. Oh, oh well, I, I was close. Anthony, edit that, edit that, edit that. Uh, I just wished it was a, a year longer. There you I go. Just there you go. <laughs> but then we were saying the last time I saw you in person, where like a lot of people I've said, oh, last time I saw you was here in 2019, like yeah, at the combine. Right. Last time I saw you was at your house. It's true. The 2019 Women's World Cup. Yep. I was driving back from my parents in South Carolina to D.C., and that was the day that the U.S. played the Netherlands. Rose Lavelle scored one of the all-time great goals. Uh, actually, I think that was the final. Um, it wasn't even a semifinal. Was it I, th- the final? I think it was the final because Rose scored in the final that year um, to win the win the thing. Uh, Rose scored an uh, incredible goal. We're running around your house cheering, <laughs> and then I get in the car and drive the rest of the way to DC. And that's the last time I saw you in person. That is, I mean. Um Nothing's happened in the world since no. then. I mean, like, yeah, it's just been business <laughs> as usual. So, uh, yeah. but it is, it is wild. This is one of my favorite events of the year because of the way that you started this segment where you just get to see so many faces, so many people yeah. that you interact with online, so many people that you have on different shows, so many people that you go back and forth with. And you just get to see them in person. It's really cool. And you, you mentioned your table is strategically placed yes. here on Radio Row to where People cannot avoid you. They have to come and walk by you. And if you uh, want to use the men's room, you got to come past table six. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring the bathroom into it, but I guess we've already said it once on the air. It's just is what it is. So I didn't yeah. pick this table. And this is it's where it's where my little sign was. No, God, but it worked it was, out. It was destiny. That's why we're here. Yeah, they suck you guys way over there. Here, all the way across the. Yeah, well, the radio I, mean, I work for PFF. We're just the nerds. We're over in the corner, just <laughs> running all the numbers. You know? Yeah, you got you got that's it's a big like, big numbers machine you got like, over there. It's just like the Matrix the whole time, where yeah. it's just the zeros and ones that are you know like cascading down the screen. That's a PFF. What's the dumbest thing someone has ever said to you because you work for PFF? What do people think PFF actually is? I mean, it's just uh, it's. I don't know if it's something specific, nothing really sticks out in my head, but there are a lot of people who are just like, oh yeah, you can't know football because you just you know, like you're just numbers people, and it's like okay, okay, that's not. It's not true. Like, we, right. we do. We, we understand the game. We get the game. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people like to hyper harp on the grades. And I'm not saying our grades are perfect. They're definitely not. It's always right. a forever evolving process. But a lot of people are like, oh, like, you guys are just nerds. Like, how do you get these grades? Well, we get the grades because we've had hands full of, of former NFL players and current NFL players who have been involved with, like, helping us shape right. the grading process and how to identify certain things. Now, does that mean we get it right every time? No. But it's just that is always the funny one that people love to harp on the grades and they go, like, oh, those you just those nerds and it's like okay well we're actually trying to really of course learn from people who have played the game who recognize and can see things very well and then we just bring our scouting and, and uh, numbers perspective the other thing that people don't realize is nfl teams internally do grades every week of course now right they are doing it with a huge leg up on you guys which is no disrespect to you guys but like they are the ones who made the play calls yeah, they know yeah, the assignments right. there's right. just certain things that when you even if you know ever like you're a former player all that kind of stuff, watch the tape. Even if you're, honestly, if you're a current player watching tape, you might not know some communication that happened on the field where two guys switched assignments and, like, only those two guys know, and so it's impossible. So, yeah, in a meeting, that's going to come up with coaches and they can incorporate it into their grade, but, like, 
you guys do as good of a job as we possibly can with the information available. We and try, I, and I and I think that as you said, it's been an ever evolving process over the years. And by the way, you guys have way more than just the grades too. I think I think that's the thing that people also like misunderstand about PFF or don't understand the depth you guys have of mm-hmm. like some of these statistics that have become pretty commonplace when you get into more advanced conversations about football of, you know, catchable ball, like all, all these yep. kinds of different stats that some folks might not even realize you guys are the ones that compile a lot of those and they right. find their way into other media. And dude, it's, it's, there's so many great, I'll just talk about the draft. Cause obviously we're here yeah. at the combine draft specifically. Well, that's what people do at the combine like with our day. Right. I covered, I cover uh, the Washington commanders. So I'm not, I, I wasn't aware. So, I mean, that's why I say that PFF's draft guide is it, it is absolutely one of the must-get draft guides every single year because there are other great draft resources out there. A lot of a lot of people that I highly respect in the industry who put out great draft draft content. But along with those other things that you should get, you should also get ours because ours has exclusive data. Like we bring right. exclusive data into how we sc- scout these prospects, how we rank them, the fits, the round grades, all the different kinds of stuff. So yeah, man, it, it, everybody loves to focus on the grades because that's just it's always the it's buzzworthy easy. things on Twitter and. You know, to those people's credit, the grades are front and center to subscriptions that they have at PFF, and there's a lot of data that sometimes they get, but there's other data that we have on the backside of things that, mm-hmm. of course, aren't 100% available to the public that we're able to see that other people can't. So like, everybody focuses on the grades, but PFF and kind of what we do, and especially how we have a relationship with a lot, all 32 NFL teams, it goes a lot deeper than that. that. Yeah, I was going to say, that's another thing. I was like, you know who else uses PFF? Every single NFL every team. Every single NFL team. Every yes. single team. Yes. Uh, Trevor Sikkim up from Pro Football Focus with us here on the Team 980. Uh, on your show earlier, you guys had Ron Rivera. What did you take away from that conversation? I mean, it's so one, uh, he respects the numbers and he looks into the numbers of PFF. So oh, he, he said he really loves the data. Unfortunately for you guys, I don't know if that's something you should brag about because that was his reason for getting Carson Wentz last year. Yeah, we actually talked about the Carson Wentz thing a little bit. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, we asked him about the decision to kind of go back to him after the injury and when you go to Sam and like all that kinds of stuff that happened at the end of the year. And then I asked him a little bit of follow-up is like, you know, how do you come to the conclusion of, of moving on from him completely? And he's just, look, he's like, look, it was just, it was not going to work out in Washington essentially. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he's mm-hmm. like, it was not going to work out in Washington. We wanted to just give him ample time to be able to find a different team that he could latch on with. But they came to that conclusion and, and they made the decision. And I, I, I mean, I, for as much as people want to look at it and say like, yeah, this is a major mistake for Ron Rivera for bringing him in and everything. Everybody's going to make mistakes. Like head coaches, GMs are going to make mistakes. The ones that last, the ones that survive, the ones that get better are the ones can, who can see that they made a mistake and be willing to move on from it. And clearly, we, we saw it the, whatever it was, the beginning of the season, middle of the season, when he passionately was up at the podium and he was like, I, like, I brought him in. Like, that's me. Like, all, yeah. you know, he put his neck out on the line to then all of a sudden just cut him, whatever it is, three months later. I mean, that's kind of just goes into that. And then that conversation obviously evolved into Sam Howell as well. The thoughts of him going into the off season. We coupled that with some Eric B enemy talk. And one question that I specifically asked him is when you were going through your offensive coordinator interviews, did you go into them with, what can you do with Sam Howell? Or is mm-hmm. it, we, we, you know, do you want to bring a different quarterback in? And I basically asked him, like, where was Sam Howell in the conversations with offensive coordinators? And he said every single offensive coordinator that we talked to, we made sure that we said, Sam, Sam Howell is our quarterback for now. What can you do with him? Not to say that they won't try to make other additions, right. but they wanted to make sure that no matter who their offensive coordinator was, they were comfortable if Sam Howell ends up being the guy that they want to go with. So right. I just I thought that was an interesting nugget of the offensive coordinator process that they made sure to not just be like, oh, quarterback's not figured out. We have no idea. They brought up Howell specifically, and they asked every offensive coordinator that they interviewed what they could do with a player like Howell. So we mentioned the grades and the, the draft guide. Uh, going back a year, what did you guys have on Howell coming out? Do you remember at least some? Like, I'm guessing it wasn't a fifth round grade. On no, it. it was much higher. I cannot remember exactly where because Mike Renner, our, our lead yeah. draft analyst, PFF, he's the guess this week on the Take Command podcast, which everyone can get now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. There you go. That was a good plug. Uh, it, Mike is the one who handles the draft guide and the final rankings, mm-hmm. so I cannot remember exactly where he had Howell, but I know he liked him a lot because of the big arm, the mobility that came with it. Um, 
and just a lot of that that went into his prospect profile. So he will. I got to think at the very worst we had him as like a like a second round pick. So for him to last, that was a major shock of mine of Sam uh, of Sam Howell lasting all the way to the fifth round. That was crazy to me. I thought the gap between when Kenny Pickett got picked in the first round and then Malik Willis and Desmond Ritter in the third round and then another two round gap between where Sam Howell was getting picked. That was nuts to me. I thought, yeah. okay, Desmond goes off the board, Malik goes off the board. I was like, here comes the other guys. Here comes Corral. Here comes. Sam Howell like it was just going to be a domino effect after that and so for Howell to be the last guy on the board that late is pretty crazy especially since if you turn back the clock a year to his sophomore tape people were talking about Sam Howell as like a potential top 10 overall pick during right. his sophomore year and you know things change you lose the offensive guys like Dami Brown's not there anymore Daz Newsom's not there anymore Javante Williams Michael Carter like all those guys leave from UNC and so that third year during um, during his time with the Tar Heels, it looked completely different. He had to be much more of a runner than he was in the previous season. Right. And when you looked at him from his sophomore season and what he was able to do as a passer, he was projected to maybe be a top 10 pick at some point. So I think we're all over the place with Sam Howe. And I am, I am happy that he's going to get what sounds like a fair shot. Does that mean he yeah. deserves to f- for sure have it? No, and that's why they haven't committed it to him. But I am glad that he is getting a fair shot, whether he was a fifth-round pick or not. Yeah, like... Considering whether he succeeds or fails has no bearing on my well-being long term and my my job. I still I presume if Sam Howell is good, I will have this show, and if Sam Howell is bad, I will have this show. With that being said, my neck not on the line. I'm really excited to watch him. Like I have no idea if it's going to work, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty pumped to see a kid this talented get a shot. Yeah. And by the way, he's now got a fantastic offensive coordinator and he's got maybe the best group of wide receivers in the whole league yeah so and they're gonna spend on offensive line so you know it's it's not like they they're not giving him the resources for it to to ultimately work out so like i'm excited to see it again i'm not predicting success but i'm pumped yeah and uh, look when we asked uh when we asked ron Rivera about eric the enemy specifically you know, he obviously didn't give us a, a lot of detail into this but i don't he, know if he has a lot of detail yet well he just said he's like i'm i'm to bring somebody in who is going to be creative in how they get the ball in the hands of our playmakers. Mm-hmm. Like that was a big point for B enemy and I guess why he ended ended up getting the job and Sam Howell, I mean again going back to that sophomore year when he had all those different weapons when he had a lot of guys to lean on, he was able to be a great point guard of a passer to get the ball in the hands of those of those playmakers which sounds like they like a lot doesn't mean they're not going to add to the room still but um yeah, it's just it, it, it's 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 a lot of like you said excitement for the new changes at quarterback and offense coordinator, all that stuff. Trevor Sycamore, Pro Football Focus, with us on the team nine eighty. The other uh, obviously big move they have to make this off season is Deron Payne. Mm-hmm. They put the franchise tag on him. Like where where does Payne fit for you in the hierarchy of defensive tackles in the NFL? I don't know. I probably you know like that the, those tier one of guys is you know, the Aaron Donalds, the Jeffrey Simmons, the Chris Jones. You know, like I, he's he's not in that tier one, but I, I just I think I've always thought that Deron Payne was a really good player. Like yeah. he is somebody who, as a centerpiece defensive lineman, makes everyone else around him better. And so it makes sense why you franchise tag him because you you just you don't want to lose him no matter what. And hopefully you figure out a deal because a deal is always better than having to franchise tag somebody because you get a lot more flexibility with it and what you're able to do. So I, I don't know where I'd put him with the tiers of, of all those defensive tackles. I wouldn't quite put him in that tier one, of course, of those major differences. Would you makers, say he's but... in the same tier as Allen or is he a tier down from John Allen? Well... Because that, like, that's a funky salary dynamic that this team's kind of got to figure out. It's like, are we willing to pay him more than John? And I know the market no, moves. I, I don't think I would pay him as much as John Allen. but that's, It's just hard because the market moves and you're two years after Allen's deal. Yeah, I mean, and of course, like that goes into it as well. Like The salary cap has moved, so yeah. like percentage of salary caps are going to go into it too. But I, I, I wouldn't say that I would have paid him on the same whatever scale, I will say, as, yeah. as John Allen. But I still think Deron Payne's a really good football player. Yeah, so do I. Um, free agency-wise, if you're the commanders and you're looking at this offensive line class, who do you want? Because, like, they're in such a weird spot, man. Because you don't know if Cosme's a guard or a tackle. Yeah. You, you definitely need at least a guard. You might need two guards. You might need a guard and a tackle. You probably need a center. You also have the draft class where you're probably going to take some or – some of those right but like is there anybody specific offensive line guard tackle that you really like uh, as a fit in washington see i my mind obviously just as a draft guy i go more towards the draft and like i I feel like they'd be better suited 
I guess they have a couple additions that they have to make along the interior, but like I feel like they'd be better suited investing that in the draft. You know, I know that they've got a cornerback need as well that a lot of people link them to, uh, Christian Gonzalez, a Joey Porter Jr., mm-hmm. like somebody like that in the middle round, and that could be an area where they go as well. But you know, there's also some good corners that are in free agency, right? Like I, I wonder if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to let Jamel Dean hit free agency. Like, it, it, is that money better spent on, okay, let's go get Jamel Dean, let him play corner, and then we're more comfortable with what we might be able to get at offensive tackle at 16 for, right. for the draft? Because at that point, like, maybe you get a Broderick Jones, maybe you get a Peter Skaronsky, maybe you get an Anton Harrison, a Darnell Wright, like, whatever it is, I think there's going to be more options in the draft at a premium position at number 16 than there would be in free agency because, let's face it, you can you can you can spin up interest in free agency for a lot of these offensive linemen, but teams don't let good offensive linemen go. Yeah, right? well, unless so, unless you you know screw the pooch contractually, like right, Washington correct. did with Brandon Sheriff. So I, that's 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 why I have his hesitation there, and and I've often mocked a corner to to the Commanders in the middle of the first round, but. I, I think offensive tackle might be the better priority for them. Yeah, corner's such a weird one. And we, we actually talked about, another guy we talked about that I actually really like the idea of for them is Brian Branch. Uh, oh, sure. To, to play I like, like Brian a, Branch for literally everyone. Right. He's phenomenal. Right. And it's like, would Baltimore take him? Yes. Okay, then you should take him. <laughs> like, that is that <laughs> is my Baltimore number test. one, the <laughs> number one rule of the draft. Does that sound like a Baltimore Raven? Okay, then you should take him on your team. How many times did they draft somebody and you go, God, that's a Raven? Every every, <laughs> every time they ever year. draft someone in the first round, you're just like, that's going to work out. Son, uh, of, a, a Baltimore son of a biscuit. Um, but, like, Brian Branch is that kind of guy, and he... People are like, well, they don't really need a safety. It's like, yeah, they do. They need they need that nickel player, that mm-hmm. like Buffalo nickel is what they call it, the big safety that's part of their base defense. And, you know, like you can play Cam Curl there, and they have, but maybe you can actually get Cam Curl back in the post a little bit more. Um, and, like, yeah, they want Percy Butler to grow, but, like, if you can get a first-round guy as opposed to a fourth-round guy, I think that's exciting potentially there. And then, you know, you need depth at corner, but – You've got Kendall Fuller. You've got Benjamin St. Juice. I don't know, like in a weird way, they are they are hamstrung by having too many options, um, which I guess is is kind of the flip side of the coin of they have a lot of needs. I think they have the the resources to fill them, mm-hmm. but they clearly have a lot of needs. And trying to match them in the free agency versus draft thing is like ultimately what Martin Mayhew and, and the front office have to do. Yeah. Um, I look again going back to Brian Branch. I mean, he's one of my favorite players in this class. I. Haven't finished my big board yet. Obviously, we got a lot of measurables. To Come on, get in it's there Wednesday at the combine, Trevor. We got a lot of measurables to get <laughs> in there and 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 things like that, but to finalize some grades. But I would just be shocked if Brian Branch wasn't a top ten player for me in this class. Top eight. I mean, he might even be top five. He's so great at what he does, and he's a major difference maker. You know, I I, I heard a lot of different coaches talk about this at their podiums here in Indy. The slot position is a starting position. Like yes. it, it, it's not it, long are the long gone are the days where you just go, oh, our third best corner is our slot player. That's right. not the case. I, I mean, you're in nickel 60, 70 percent of the time anyways. Like that is your base formation. That is what you are playing the majority of the time. And so with that being the case, you look at how creative offenses and offense coordinators are around the NFL. They're putting tight ends. They're putting big wide receivers. They're putting fast wide receivers. They're putting everybody in the slot. And for Washington to potentially have a guy like Brian Branch who could go up against different defensive backs of all shapes and sizes, who is one of the f- smartest football players that we have in this class, one of those re- reliable players who I think Brian Branch has been starting for three years and he's missed three total tackles. He's That's been starting for three years. In the SEC. Three total tackles. It's insane. I mean, the, the reliability there is nuts. So I, I think that he could definitely be an option there. I, again, I think that he could be an option for basically every team. But I, I, do, I do wonder if going – the corner route in free agency, the secondary route in free agency, and then trying to focus more on the offensive line wouldn't serve them better. Yeah, I do I do wonder how burned they feel by the William Jackson thing, whether they're like, no, we're not going down that road again, which is kind of what they're doing at quarterback, where you they're know, like, ah, we went down the expensive road once and no, it was but bad. He, but here's the thing. Why did William Jackson not work for the commanders? He wasn't a scheme fit. Right. You could scout the guy wrong and he could be a scheme fit. You draft him at 16, right? Totally. So at that point, it can't, it can't be... And I don't know if this is the case with Washington, but 
you can't not go out and and get a corner that you like out of fear of that happening again because that could also happen right in you the have draft. to you actually have to get the evaluation right like what and a concept right right you do you, whether you're you spending money or draft pick you have to be right have to get the evaluation right yes i get it. uh trevor sigma from pff with us for uh, about another minute or so here on the show um oh there's something else you said oh the other thing with with branch and i think this is like a larger football topic that is interesting and i don't know if you have any numbers off the top of your head to talk about this but like the amount that teams run out of 11 now as well yeah um I, yeah but, but like with branch you don't have to worry about him because that starting position is not really a nickel it's not really a, a strong side linebacker it's both and that that having a player at that position who is not like as you mentioned like Oh, well, it used to be a third best corner, and it used to always be like the little sh- shifty guys were the slot receivers. Yeah. And as you mentioned, everybody's in the slot now. So you're not looking for a little shifty nickel corner. You're looking for a guy who can fit the run and guard everybody mm-hmm. uh, in man to man situations or not get boxed out in his own by a tight end, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And that's where a guy like Branch becomes so valuable. And, and I, I also wonder, like, does that mean, you know, you said you're going to have Branch probably top 10, top eight, top five on your board? Do teams start make that adjustment? Because it feels like they make it philosophically, and then it takes like two years for their boards to catch up. Yeah, so uh, one of my takeaways that I had from the podium session yesterday was Terry Fontenot, who is the Atlanta Falcons general manager. He used to be the assistant general manager for the New Orleans Saints for many, many years. He talked about the emphasis on the nickel position, and he called it a critical position. Mm-hmm. And so much so, the way that he talked about it makes me feel like at number eight overall, they could go with Brian Branch. Like, that's how mm-hmm. high I think he could go in this draft. Now, it's to be seen, right, because I think that that's a great point that you make. We all talk about slot corner being a valuable position, but we really have yet to see teams to- around the league, I will say. There's a couple of instances where you're yeah. picking guys like, pretty you know, high. L- well, or like L.A. puts Jalen Ramsey in the slot because they're like, sure. we're going to use our best player there because it's that important. Right, but like that's the thing. Like Brian Branch could be your best player. Right. You know, right, And, right, and right. I think that that's kind of just what goes uh, into his scouting profile. And I do think that we're, we are going to get to the point where defenses and especially draft boards are going to have to reflect how important that nickel position is. And when you are a true artist of a nickel defender the value of that is going to get higher and higher the more offenses continue to exploit that with like i said tight ends bigger receivers faster receivers all these different types of players because you could be playing you know you could be playing against uh travis kelsey in the slot in one week and then you could play against hunter renfro in the slot the next right and brian branch to play if, if you don't have to completely shift your scheme and you can still put the same player out there who can guard Travis Kelsey, that can guard Hunter Renfro, Renfro, that's incredibly valuable. And by the way, the next week is the Titans, and you have to fit the run. And, like, you're up for Correct. it. Correct. Right. And, like, that's – that's that's can you hit that trifecta? And there's just not a lot of dudes that can. Branch might be one of those guys, Yep. Uh, which is why he's going to be picked very high. And this draft is up to Trevor. He'd, he'd be, like, fifth. Overall, yeah, I pick him number one. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred. I wasn't going to go there, but like I was, you know, yeah. I left the door open. And Bears, walked go, right through Bears, it. Bears are just going to say no to every quarterback trade offer. <laughs> they're going to stick it around. They're going to stick it one, and they're going to pick a nickel and corner. That's good asset management. <laughs> uh, all right, now's now's the part where I ask you uh, where people can go get more of you. Uh, where, where where can people go? PFF.com. Uh, you can see a lot of our, our great draft work that we've got there. If you are into draft podcasts, the NFL Stock Exchange podcast, myself and Connor Rogers are doing that three days a week, uh, having a lot of fun doing it, covering the NFL draft in every way that we possibly can. Also on Twitter, a lot of my shenanigans over at, at Tampa Bay Trey. And there is really high quality shenanigans there. And I, this is a show that knows shenanigans. <laughs> You got some, you got some, you got some good bits. Thank you. Trevor Sikkim, everybody, pro football focus. Great to see you. Uh, we come back. I don't know what we're doing, but we'll figure it out when we get there. It's the Hoffman show on the team 980 and the Odyssey app.